My big project over the next couple of years is to show how American pragmatism influenced Oxford philosophy in its glory years, the heyday of Oxford ordinary language philosophy, sometimes gets called Oxford linguistic philosophy of the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. And uh, I spent my six-month Jackman Humanities Institute uh, research leave in Oxford, mostly at the Bodleian Library, doing some archival research, and also at the Lineker College Library, where the papers of Gilbert Ryle are held. Gilbert Ryle was one of the pillars of Oxford Ordinary Language philosophy, and in 1949 he wrote a very famous book uh, called The Concept of Mind. And in this book, he really upended the traditional view of the mind as a ghost within a machine, where there is a kind of slideshow of pictures that is, that is privately available to the person themselves, but inaccessible to uh, other people. And in this book, The Concept of Mind, Ryle argued that that's not how we should see the mind. Rather, the mind is a set of dispositions to act in certain ways and behave. This was a, a very unusual uh, view, and it was thought to be brand new. And in uh, this talk today, I'm going to articulate, show you one little gem that I found in my archival researches during the Jackman Humanities Institute Fellowship. So in the concept of, of mind, Ryle had two really big important ideas. The first is the distinction between knowing that and knowing how. So philosophers had always thought that knowledge is a, is a matter of knowing that something is true. I know that there is a desk in front of me. I know that it's not raining outside. I know that my name is Cheryl Misak. And this was thought to be what knowledge was. And Ryle said, hang on, there's another kind of knowledge that is just as important, just as uh, significant as knowing that something is true, and that is knowing how to do something. I know how to hit a cross-court backhand in, on the tennis court, and even though some people might say, ah yes, well, you can break that knowledge about how to hit a cross-court backhand down to a bunch of propositions about, well, you first you pull your racket back, the second you lean into the ball and you hit with such and such velocity. But Ryle said, no, 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 knowledge, how to do something, can't be broken down into a set of propositions about knowing that. Uh, you do this, X, Y, and Z. So that was one big, important, presumably new idea that Ryle had. And the second idea was that causal or scientific laws of nature, universal generalizations, such as all humans are mortal, inductive conclusions, such as uh, the sun will rise tomorrow since it's risen every day in the past, are inference tickets. It's not that on the old view uh, we have some metaphysical connection between the cause and the effect, the evidence we have that the sun has been rising every day and the conclusion that it will rise tomorrow. Rather, all of these things, causal laws, inductive conclusions, are like walking around with a ticket to draw an inference. So when you have, uh, when you believe that all humans are mortal, instead of thinking that there's some metaphysical connection between humans and mortality, you think that what you have is a ticket that you walk around with. Every human you see, you in effect produce that ticket and you say, aha, that's a human. I can infer that that human is mortal. This was again thought to be a really unusual and new view of uh, universal generalizations. Where did Ryle get his interest in dispositions, rules, infant tickets, knowing how to do things? Well, I'm going to argue in my big project that he got, uh, he got these ideas from American pragmatism, from the founder of American pragmatism, Charles Sanders Peirce, 
uh, via Frank Ramsey and Margaret MacDonald. So here's Peirce. Uh, in 1900, the founder of pragmatism uh, really captured the insight at the heart of pragmatism in the following way. He said, we must not begin by talking of pure ideas, vagabond thoughts that tramp the public roads without any human habitation. We must begin rather with men, humans, and their conversation. This is the insight of pragmatism that we don't begin with metaphysics or logical analysis. We begin with human beings and the way we work, our practices, our conversation, uh, our ways of being. So pragmatism aims to understand philosophical concepts traditionally conceived very abstractly or metaphysically through an examination of their place in the concrete human practices of inquiry, action, contestation, adjudication, judgment, and so on. When we analyze a concept such as the concept of truth, belief, probability, induction, we must ask how we use it, not ask for its logical analysis. And Peirce was very clear about what he thought a belief was, what he thought the pragmatist should think of uh, belief. A belief is not something like what Hume said, an intensity in the mind or a vividness in the mind. It's a, a belief is individuated in terms of action. A belief is a habit of action. If I believe that all humans are mortal, I act in a certain way when I meet a human being. Now Ryle, in his papers at Lineker College, Oxford, had Peirce's collected papers in his library. They started to appear in 1931. This is very odd for an Oxford philosopher in the mid-1930s to have a copy of Peirce's eight-volume collected papers. And Ryle got these ideas not just from Peirce, that he very carefully annotated Peirce's uh, collected papers, but he also got these ideas from Frank Ramsey, who was a follower of, of Peirce. In fact, he was uh, Britain's most impressive uh, follower of Peirce, most impressive pragmatist. Ramsey lived from 1903 to 1930. It doesn't take much of a mathematician to see that he had a very, very short life. Uh, in, that, in that short lifespan, he did a remarkable number of things. For instance, he has a theory of uh, pure mathematics, a branch of pure mathematics named after him, Ramsey theory. He's the founder of subjective probability theory. He figured out how to measure partial belief and key it to rational choice. So he really is the founder of, uh, of decision theory. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a genius, and I don't use that word lightly. He also was a pragmatist, uh, started reading Peirce in 1922 when he was an undergraduate and called himself a pragmatist from uh, 1926. And Ryle also had an annotated copy of Ramsey's posthumously collected papers in his library. And I took a picture of Ryle's copy of the Foundation of Mathematics. As you can see, it's quite well read. Ryle, though, got these ideas from Peirce and Ramsey through a woman named Margaret MacDonald. She also, like Ramsey, was born in 1903 lived a little bit longer, but as you can see, not too much longer. Uh, Margaret MacDonald is really, really interesting. She had a very uh, tough path through life and through the academic establishment. She was abandoned as a child, raised in an orphanage, somehow uh, got herself to uh, Birkbeck College uh, in London, which had been established as the Working People's College. And uh, there she did her doctorate with Susan Stebbing at another part of the University of London, Bedford College. And there's uh, Susan Stebbing for you. Margaret MacDonald was a really fine Peirce scholar. This is a paper she wrote in 1935 in a journal that we no longer uh, have in our libraries called Psyche on Peirce's uh, theory of language. It's an excellent paper, very long. 
She was also uh, a very fine analytic philosopher, one of the founders of the journal Analysis. She wrote a lot about logical positivism. And she also, as a postgraduate student, uh, took notes in Wittgenstein's classes uh, between 1934 and 1937. She was one of the very few people that Wittgenstein thought uh, was able to take notes in his classes. Once that postgraduate uh, fellowship in Cambridge was over, MacDonald moved to Oxford in 1937. And uh, she went to St. Hilda's College, not in an academic position. She was a part-time librarian. It was the best job she could get with uh, the opportunity to give a little bit of philosophy coaching on the side. And when she got to Oxford, she said uh, this, it's up on your slide, Oxford is dullish after Cambridge, but some of it is interesting. What she would find interesting was Gilbert Ryle, who she became very friendly with. The same year she moves to Oxford, 1937, MacDonald gives the first paper uh, in a symposium at the joint session of the Aristotelian and Mind Societies in Bristol. This is the premier event of the British uh, philosophical world. The symposium was on induction and hypothesis. And in that paper, MacDonald, uh, well, MacDonald presented the first paper and Gilbert Ryle and Isaiah Berlin responded. Now, Ramsey had said that an empirical generalization or a law is a rule of conduct or a guide for behavior of the form, if you meet an X, treat it as having a Y. This is a, a quote from MacDonald. So Ramsey offers this view of an empirical generalization or a law. Uh, if you meet an X, treat it as having a Y. And she says, sometimes, like C.S. Peirce, he speaks of laws both as rules and as habits. To believe P is to act from a P-formed habit. To believe that toadstools are poisonous is to form the habit of avoiding toadstools unless you wish to be ill or die. So clearly this is the same uh, view of habit that, uh, of, of, sorry, the same view of, of empirical generalizations, inductive conclusions that we find in Peirce and in Ryle. And MacDonald notes in this paper that here, this is Ramsey's account of generalizations. She raises a concern for this kind of, of empiricism about generalizations. She says it's not clear how we can know a rule, if you meet an X, treat it as a Y, to be true or false. Is a rule true or false? And it's also not clear how we can believe a rule. Do I believe a rule of behavior? It seems wrong. We seem to believe propositions, not rules. Uh, and so MacDonald raises this as a worry, and she answers the concern. And her answer builds on Ramsey's answer. MacDonald says, there is another sense of no, I think, which applies to rules, but is not opposed to believe. We can ask, do you know your instructions? Do you know the rules? Do you know what to do when you meet a man or a toadstool or a piece of arsenic? So if you are armed with a generalization, all humans are mortal. When you meet a man, you'll treat that person as, a, as someone who will die if you run your car over him. Uh, if you believe that, uh, that arsenic is poisonous, do you know what to do when you meet a piece of arsenic? Yes, you don't ingest it. Those things you can know. So, MacDonald gives us a Ramsian account of induction and general hypotheses. Uh, we can assess them in terms of how well these rules of action meet the future. We know them in a way that is different, but not inferior to the way that we know that some particular person is mortal, or that a particular sample of arsenic, or a particular toadstool has just made someone ill. And MacDonald says, this is the distinction between knowing how and knowing that. This is a direct quote from her paper. There is another sense of no, I think, which applies to rules, but it is not opposed to believing. We can ask, do you know your instructions? Do you know the rules? And so on. In 1937, in this symposium, in Ryle's response, he simply didn't get it. He didn't understand what MacDonald was saying, and he was downright sneering about her. Not very much is said by her distinctions, Ryle said in his response. 
He also said, let us accept with some relief Miss MacDonald's advice to us not to adopt certain over procrustean styles of diction, which other philosophers have recommended, and let us resume with more confidence our workaday habit of talking with the vulgar. But then let us talk about induction. And here, I think, there remain certain thorny puzzles which cannot be removed by the mere knack of pricking up our ears for delicate differences of nuance between certain ordinary English words. So Ryle is, is sneering at MacDonald, saying all she's doing is uh, identifying persnickety differences between different senses of knowing, knowing how and knowing that. And he took MacDonald in this paper to be promoting what he called a vexatious verificationism. Miss MacDonald unfortunately falls in with the tiresome fashion of tying up the problem of induction with that of prediction of the future. Ryle would soon come to see the attractions of Mark MacDonald's proposals. He made the distinction between knowing that and knowing how famous in that uh, book of his, uh, the concept of mind. And he also argued that laws or, and rules are inference tickets. This is Ryle now. He says, law statements are true or false, but they do not state truths or falsehoods of the same type as those asserted by the statements of fact to which they apply. They have different jobs. At least part of the point of trying to establish laws is to find out how to infer from particular matters of fact to other particular matters of fact. A law is used, so to speak, as an inference ticket, a season ticket, which licenses its possessors to move from asserting factual statements to asserting other factual statements. Now, I hope in this very quick whirlwind tour of uh, pragmatism, we've seen Peirce, Ramsey, Mark and MacDonald all articulate the view of laws as being inference tickets and Ryle just picks it up uh, without any acknowledgement from of Mark and MacDonald or any inkling that it has come from Ramsey or from American pragmatism and there he is uh, looking uh, as smug and superior as can be. Ryle was really uh, for decades uh, at, at, the, at the very heart of not only Oxford philosophy, but philosophy in the entire English speaking world. He was, he was one of the best known philosophers in the decades, 1940s, right through to 1970s. Unlike Ramsey and MacDonald, he lived a long and hearty life but he never acknowledged uh, where his ideas came from. He lifted them whole cloth uh, right out of Mark and MacDonald's paper. And part of my aim is to bring Mark and MacDonald back into the light of the history of analytic philosophy, where she belongs. And if you like, push Gilbert Ryle uh, into the shadows where uh, it may be that he belongs as well. So I had a, a wonderful six months uh, in Oxford, found out something really interesting that I think uh, is going to uh, be a, a little bit uh, heretical in the history of philosophy and uh, will take uh, a lot of people by surprise. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Cheers.